in my book on spirit, soul, and body. If you haven't got this, I really encourage you to get it. I've heard thousands of people testify about how this has just changed their life. And we also have a, um, of course, we have a CD set and we have a DVD set as seen here on television. But I also have a new study guide. And this is the same teaching put into a study format. I'm excited about this truth. And I, I just believe that the word that is contained in these truths that we're talking about will change your life as it has mine. So I've already laid a foundation on some of this. I've used 1 Thessalonians 5.23 to show that we have a spirit, soul, and body. Functionally, most people only acknowledge the physical body and the soulish realm because they're tangible. And you are in touch with them. You automatically know if your body's hot or cold, uh, hurting or feeling good. You know your soulish realm, whether you're happy or sad. You are constantly monitoring these, and everybody knows the existence of your body and your soul. But the spirit is a third part of you that 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says you have a spirit, soul, and body. And in the spirit realm, Jesus said in John 3.6 that spirit is spirit, flesh is flesh. You can't feel or discern. There is no connection between the physical body, the soulish realm, and your spiritual realm. Spirit is spirit. Flesh is flesh. And so because of that, most people are what the Bible calls carnal. And of course, that word has a connotation that is very offensive to some people, and they think that means sinful or ungodly. And it is true that a tremendous amount of carnality is sinful and ungodly. But the word carnal just literally means of the five senses. When the Bible is talking about being carnal, it's talking about being physical, flesh-oriented, controlled, uh, being focused on that. And so if you are carnal, occupied with only your five senses and what they can tell you, then most people functionally don't even acknowledge the existence of the Spirit. And certainly they aren't familiar enough with the spiritual realm and who we are in the Spirit to have that truth change their life. One of the things I'm trying to do through this teaching is to let you know that there is a spirit inside of man. And the spirit and soul are different. You can't feel the spirit. People will use that terminology and say, do you feel the spirit? And I'm not going to teach on that right now, but technically you cannot feel the spirit. When you do, quote unquote, feel the spirit, the way people talk about it, what that is, faith is tangible. Faith, uh, the anointing of God, can be felt. You can actually put it into a cloth. Acts 19.11, Paul put the anointing of God into a cloth and an apron and passed them from their body, from his body, and diseases departed out of people, and people that were demon-possessed were delivered. Faith is tangible. Faith can produce physical things. So when you are in faith and perceive by faith, not by your five senses, but by faith that the Spirit of God is here, that the anointing of God is here, well, then you can feel the effects of that faith. But technically speaking, you can't feel the Spirit. The Spirit is always with you. Those of you that are born again, the Spirit of God will never leave you nor forsake you. Sometimes you perceive it by faith and you may feel something and feel joy or feel a goose bump or feel a, you know, something, but it's really not the Spirit that you're feeling. It's your faith that is producing these emotions and uh, feelings. And the reason I think that this is so important is because if you think that your physical senses can perceive the spiritual realm and spiritual truth and spiritual reality, then I guarantee you, you aren't going to be in agreement with what the Word of God says because you can't perceive at all times that God is with you. There's sometimes that because tragedy has come up, somebody has done something to hurt you, you've got some impending problem, the doctor has just told you you're going to die, you're car is being repossessed or whatever, you will be focused on the physical realm and you won't feel any presence of God at all. And if you think that you can feel into the spirit realm, and if God was with you, you'd know it. If God really loved you, you'd know it. If that's the mindset that you have, then you are going to be talked out of things that are spiritual realities. It transformed my life to recognize that there is a spiritual world and there's a spirit on the inside of me that cannot 
be discerned by any physical standard. You have to just go to the Word of God and take the Word of God and believe what it says. Boy, this began to transform my life. And let me turn over to another passage of Scripture and share this with you. This is one of the Scriptures that God used that just revolutionized my life. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as a matter of fact, I was going to quote to you from verse 17, but let me read the verse in front of this. I'll need to turn over there so that I'll get it correctly. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 16 says, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. You know, this is kind of awkward. It's wordy in the King James that I'm reading. But what this is basically talking about is the previous verses are talking about Jesus died for everyone because we were all dead in our sins and he is resurrected. We are now alive in Christ, which is all talking about in the spiritual realm. And because of this, Paul is saying we don't know people anymore after the flesh. In other words, he doesn't deal with people. He doesn't uh, judge people based on their external, the way they look, the, you know, all these kind of things. Boy, there is so much in this. I haven't got time to go into all of it, but let me just point out a couple of things. I'd encourage you to study this on your own. But if we would adopt this mindset, if we only knew people based on who they are in Christ, based on their personal relationship with God instead of all of these externals, you know what it would do? It would totally eliminate prejudice. Prejudice based on the color of your skin or based on whether, you know, the height or whether you're fat, or whether you are pretty, or whether you're ugly, or based on any of these kind of things. If we knew people based on who they were in the spirit realm, instead of their carnal, physical, external realm, had to do away with all prejudice. I tell you, he says not only do we not know people after the flesh, but he says we don't know Christ after the flesh. He says at one time we knew Christ after the flesh, but now henceforth know we him no more. Just think about this. I'm not going to take time to turn over and read all of this, but if you were to turn to John chapter 13, I believe it's verse 23, you will see that at the Last Supper that Jesus held with his disciples, that John, the apostle, it says, was leaning on his bosom. Of course, people in those days when they ate, they didn't have a table and chairs set around it. They had a very low table, and they would sit on pillows and stuff, and they would kind of recline and lay down as they ate. And it's picturing that there was a familiarity, a love among Jesus and his disciples that the apostle John, who he said himself, he was the beloved apostle, the one whom Jesus loved. Man, he loved Jesus. And they had a relationship so that at this last supper, he was actually leaning over on Jesus. This shows a familiarity and a love with Jesus. But did you know that this same apostle in Revelation Chapter 1 saw the resurrected Jesus, and his hair was white. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like polished brass with um, flame running through it. He saw Jesus resurrected in his glory, and this time he fell on his face as if he was dead. He was overwhelmed with the majesty and the glory of Jesus. Did you know Jesus was the same in both places? When Jesus was with his disciples in the spirit realm, he was God Almighty. And the power and the glory and the majesty that was revealed in Revelation was inside of Jesus, but it was clothed in that physical body. And what Paul is referring to here is that at one time the disciples knew Jesus based on his external. If you would have asked them, what is, what is Jesus like? They would have described how tall he was, what the color of his hair was, maybe some of his facial features. They might have been able to tell you about some of the miracles, but they really knew him basically based on their five senses. But after Jesus died and then rose from the dead, you know, he was different. Not that he changed on the inside, but he was now no longer... Uh, the glory of God that it was inside of him was no longer shielded or there wasn't a veil over it the way there was before. His glorified body radiated the glory of God in a way that his physical body never could. I'm saying all of these things to say that when he says, we don't know Jesus after the flesh anymore. We knew him that way one time, but we don't know him that way anymore. 
It all comes back to that one time they just looked on the external. But now they see because of what he went through, because he overcame death, because he resurrected. They saw him literally just ascend up into heaven and be caught up into the clouds. And they saw these angels say that the same one that you've seen ascend will also come again in the clouds. And now they had a new revelation. They knew Jesus far beyond what his physical features were, the physical limitations of that body. They now knew him in the spirit realm. That's what he's talking about. And then the next verse says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And this is talking about in the spirit realm. Let me make one more uh, application before I go on into the 17th verse. And that is that not only should we not know people just based on their physical thing and judge people and relate to them based on their physical color or, you know, their beauty or their skills and talents and stuff like that. And not only should we go beyond just the physical body of Jesus, which of course isn't a real problem with us since none of us have known him after the flesh. The only way we've come to know Jesus is through the spirit realm. But not only do we uh, not know people after the flesh, and we don't know Jesus after the flesh, but the number one way that we need to interpret this is that you don't need to know yourself after the flesh. There are many of you that if I was, you know, talking to you on the phone, I'd say, well, what do you look like? Who are you? You would describe the color of your hair. You would tell me how tall you are, whether you're a male or female. You would describe this, this. Most of the things that we would use to describe ourselves are dealing with this physical, external realm. Some of you would go beyond that and talk about things that you've experienced, maybe your attitude, this is what you believe, and things like this. But you know what? There's not very many people that if I was to say, what are you like in the spirit? What's happened? What do you have? Do you have the power of God living on the inside of you? There's most people watching this program, even most Christians, that really do not have a clear picture of who you are. If I was to ask who you are in the physical realm, you could give me enough information that you could sit down and draw a picture of you and be recognizable. If I was to ask about what you're like in your emotion realm, you know what, you would either describe to me a person who has it all together, a person who's confident and bold, or maybe you'd describe a person who's been wounded and hurt, and you could draw some kind of a picture that would symbolize and show what you feel like on the inside. But most of you could not tell me what you're like in the spirit. And this is a major problem since the spirit part of you is the real you. How in the world are you ever going to release it if you don't even know what's happened to you on the inside? And this has led to a bunch of problems. One of them is that most people think that God has all of this power out there, that he has healing, anointing, victory, faith, power, etc., etc., but they see it as being out there in the heavens somewhere, and they are praying and asking God to put forth his hand and touch them and give them something. As we go through this teaching, and I explain it to you, one of the things that you're going to learn is that everything, everything that God has for you, I mean for all eternity, a million years from today in eternity, everything that will be true of you in heaven in eternity is already true in your spirit. Your spirit right now is the same spirit that you will have throughout all eternity. It's as pure, as holy as Jesus is. It's as righteous as Jesus is. It has the knowledge that Jesus has. It has the same anointing, the same virtue, the same faith, the same joy, everything. Somebody says, well, it does not. If, it, if I had that, I'd know it. No, again, I go back to Jesus' own words in John 3, 6. It says, that which is spirit is spirit, that which is flesh is flesh. You cannot know it, feel it, discern it through any of our carnal uh, senses. You have to go to God's word and take what God's word says as being spirit and life. You know, if you were in a building right now and if you heard something outside and you were wondering whether it was a wind or whether it's rain or whether something, if you didn't have any windows, or let's just say that you only had one window, you couldn't tell exactly what's going on outside because you're inside. The environment, the atmosphere is different. What you would have to do is go look out that window and what you saw through that window would give you an indication of what was going on outside. Well, it's the same thing in the spirit realm. You don't know with just your physical limitations what is true in the spirit realm. What you do is go to the Word of God and like a window into the spirit realm. If you want to see 
what you are like in the spirit realm, then look into the Word. Look through this. Take what the Word of God has to say about you and believe that that's who you are. And so all of that being said, here is the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, this is talking about being born again, belonging to Christ, you've experienced this new birth. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now that is one powerful, powerful scripture. And you know what? A lot of people stumble over that because they say, well, now wait a minute. The Bible here is saying that if you are in Christ, then old things have passed away, all things have become new. And you know what? They can't see that change in their life. And so many people get discouraged and wonder about, well, I prayed and I asked God to come in and forgive me of my sins and, and receive salvation, but I just still have a lot of the same problems. I just don't know if it worked. Well, see, that's a problem because they are thinking that the change is going to be external. They think that the change is going to happen in their body and in their soul. But you can tell by nothing but process of elimination that this verse, if it's true, which it is, has to be talking about the spirit part of you. Because if you were fat before you got saved, did you know you're still going to be fat after you get saved? Your body doesn't just instantly change. We've got the promise over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says this corruptible, talking about your body, must put on incorruption. Right now, we live in a corrupted body. It is not the glorified body that we're going to have. Jesus showed us that when he was resurrected from the dead, his glorified body could just zip from place to place. It could appear and disappear. They had the room locked one time with all of the doors and the windows locked, and yet Jesus just all of a sudden appeared in the room. That's the way that our glorified body will be. Our physical body isn't like that now. Our physical body is not the part that is in Christ. Now, it's been purchased and we have a promise that we're going to have a glorified body, but it's not redeemed yet. It's purchased, but not redeemed. And so it's not your body that old things passed away and all things became new. It's also not your soul. You can prove that by your last test score. You can prove that by many of you forget where you put your keys, where you, uh, you know, have your glasses, and your glasses are on top of your head, and you're looking <laughs> everywhere for them. You know what? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we only know in part and we prophesy in part. But there's coming a time when we'll receive this glorified body and we'll know all things, even as also we are known. Now, that's a future tense thing. That hasn't happened yet. None of us know everything with our little peanut brain the way that we are going to know in the future. So by observation, you can tell that your physical body Old things haven't passed away. All things haven't become new. Your soulish realm, your mental, emotional part, old things haven't passed away. All things haven't become new. If you were stupid before you got saved, you're still going to be stupid after you get saved until you begin to start renewing your mind and changing that situation. So what's left? According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, we have a spirit, soul, and body. We know by observation that your body and your soul, your emotional, mental part, hasn't changed yet. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when it says, if you are in Christ, old things have passed away. Behold, all things, not some things, not a majority of things, not a lot of things, all things have become new. In the spirit is what this is talking about. It has to be. Process of elimination. It has to be talking about your spirit. When you get born again in the spirit, you become a totally, totally new person. One translation of this verse says, they become a new species of being that never existed before. Boy, that's powerful. You know, right here, I just want to let this soak in for a minute before I go on and begin to say some other things about it. But most Christians do not really perceive this and grab hold of this. You know, one of the examples or, or, or way of illustrating this is that I have thousands and thousands of prisoners who watch me on television, listen to my materials. And every time I preach on spirit, soul, and body, our response from prisoners goes way up. And, and it will typically be something along this line, that these people were in prison, 
Of course, they realized that their life was in a mess. They were looking for a new chance, a new beginning. Some preacher comes along and tells them, if you're in Christ, you become a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. Would you like to be new? Would you like to have a do-over? Would you like another chance? And, of course, many prisoners will, yes, that's what I need. And so they pray and ask the Lord to come into their life because they realize they need to change. They are wanting to change. So they make this prayer. They receive Jesus. Then they wake up in the morning. They're in the same jail cell. They're wearing the same jail, uh, you know, clothing. They are dealing with the same prison guards. The prison system is treating them exactly the same for their sins that they've committed. And they can't, in the physical realm, observe this change. And many of them who were really sincere and believed get discouraged thinking, well, God didn't hear my prayer. Nothing has changed. And when I share that it's in the spirit that you become brand new, and then the way that you get what, all of this change that has taken place in your spirit to start impacting your physical realm is by the renewing of your mind. As I share this, it's like a light bulb comes on. All of a sudden, they realize, no, it was true. God heard my prayer. And as I renew my mind and begin to start changing my actions, I will in the future see this physical transformation, but the transformation in my spirit is already complete. It's already done. And you know, you don't have to be behind prison bars to have that same misconception. There's lots of people who are on the outside who thought that they were just going to be transformed when Jesus came into their life, and they haven't seen, they still have problems, they still have strife in their marriage, they still have fears, they still have sickness, and they are wondering about, I thought everything was going to be different. The transformation takes place in your spirit, and then it's through the renewing of your mind that you begin to draw this power that's in your spirit out into the physical realm. Boy, these are powerful truths. These truths have changed my life. And I'm just laying a foundation. We are going to start building on this, and we're going to go through this series talking about spirit, soul, and body. And I tell you, this could change your life. It certainly has mine. I'd like to encourage you to please listen as our announcer gives you some information and write and get these materials. We have this re-release of my book. We have tens of thousands of these that have gone out. And if you haven't got this, I'd encourage you to get it or get one and share with someone else. We've got our study guide. Please listen and then call our right today and join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's four-part teaching titled Spirit, Soul, and Body is available in a CD album or it's available in a DVD album as seen on TV. Ask for T1027 and be sure to specify CD or DVD when you make a gift of 13 pounds or more the first teaching in the audio CD album is also available for a donation of three pounds or more. We encourage everyone to send a gift, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this first CD free of charge. Request teaching TK91 when you write or call and we'll be pleased to send it to you. Spirit, Soul and Body, the book is also available when you send a gift to the work of this ministry. Request T318 when you write, call, or go to our website. For the very first time, this teaching is available in a companion study guide for a gift of 17 pounds 50 or more. Included is a CD-ROM that allows you to duplicate any resources needed for each lesson. Request study guide T418 when you contact the ministry. The very best way to reach us is through our website. You can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day at awme.net. Or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. Again, that's 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44. 1922-473-300. Helpline hours extend from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If the lines are jammed, remember you can go to our website and there's no fee for reaching us through the internet. If you prefer to write us, our address is AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. We hope to hear from you today.
I'd like to encourage you to go visit our website. We have that address on your screen, and I tell you, we have one of the most um, powerful websites of anything I've ever seen. I get comments about how user-friendly it is. I have hundreds of my teaching available for free downloads, and there's literally been people's lives saved by having all of this teaching material available to them free of charge. We have our living commentary there. I have about, I think it's eight years or more of our television programs that you can view right there on the website. We have about 10 or 11 years worth of my radio programs there. It's just a wealth of information, so please join us on our website. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Kampala, Uganda, July 11th and 12th. He'll also be in the Northwest Province of South Africa on July 20th and July 21st through the 23rd. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. I want to let you know that on July the 20th through the 23rd, I'm going to be ministering in South Africa. And I'm really excited to be coming back. This will be only my second trip there. On the 20th, I'm going to be ministering at Spirit Word Ministries. This is a Sunday afternoon service. And then on Monday through Wednesday, Arthur Minchez, and I know that that's not the way you pronounce his last name, but Arthur's a very good friend of mine, and he is South African. We're going to be holding a meeting on Monday through Wednesday with morning and evening services. And it's just going to be a great time in the Lord. So remember, this is July the 20th at Spirit Word Ministries. And then the 21st through the 23rd, we'll be using their facilities for our own conference there. It'll be called the Grace and Faith Conference. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more gospel truth. Not just some things changed, but everything completely and totally.